This quick wrap up to the stellar examination of catastrophe is meant to dive deeper into what I think is a critical factor in the differences between stellar ignition triggering times and a bit more on other stars we could potentially investigate, along with the context of this tangent examination as a whole. Since this stellar examination is indeed a tangent of the core issue of Earth's magnetic reversal and the solar system magnetic shift, it won't shock you to learn that the astrosphere is likely the main determining factor in a star's response to the galactic current sheet or wave. Their size matters, the star's metallicity matters, the rotation speed and age matters, but not as much as whether or not they are a flare star. The stellar magnetic field, heliosphere at our sun, or astrosphere at any other star, is the star's version of a magnetic bubble, a magnetic shield. The stronger they flare, the stronger their magnetic bubble, which not only blocks out cosmic rays, but would defend against the galactic current sheet or wave. Space weather corollaries on Earth should be jumping into your brains, veteran observers. And for things like close binaries like Alpha Centauri A and B, their combined magnetic shields, their astrospheres, make a formidable opponent for the galaxy. For the most powerful stars, say, towards the outermost parts of the galaxy, I bet the current sheet can't do much to them at all. And so with that in mind, and especially recalling our part two examination of the timing of star flaring nearby, let's dive deeper into the final notes from part two, the problem of investigating other stars. So indeed, we do have enough evidence to conclusively state that Proxima Centauri had an unprecedented super flare amidst a general surge in activity of late, and that about 20 years earlier, a similar surge took place at the thought-to-be non-flaring star Barnard, which is no longer characterized as such. But as you go further out, the stars are somewhat less well understood, their distance uncertainties grow, and there are other problems too. Here is a list of the closest stars. The Wikipedia entry does match the official catalog and indeed is only a tenth as annoying to look at, so here we go. And in closest order to Earth at the top, starting with Sol, our Sun, and including the Centauri system below that, Barnard's star follows. The next stars are either non-flaring cold dwarfs, or they're on the wrong side of the solar system from the center of the galaxy, like Wolf and Sirius. Truly the first good candidate we have after Barnard is Ross 154, sitting at just over 9 light years away. This too is a flare star, strong astrosphere, seen shining in X-rays since the beginning, and scientists saw an incredible outburst there years ago too. But it was also towards the end of 1992, perhaps at the beginning of 1993, actually a few months after the Barnard blast. Now this star is almost dead on a line with the center of the galaxy, as you can see at the pulsing crosshairs here, and given that it is almost three light years further than Barnard, here is where things get tricky. Because while the galactic current sheet or galactic wave would almost certainly have hit Ross before Barnard, Ross would be much, much harder to trigger. Its astrosphere is powerful, it's a flare star like Proxima, and while Barnard is relatively unshielded by comparison, potentially taking the effects right away, the flare stars of Ross and Proxima simply have no physics-based argument for being triggered so quickly, which is another reason I am confident in the analysis that the sheet is already affecting our system. The Proxima date betrays our logic, as it was delayed much more than Barnard's reaction, just like Ross. Beyond that, things get way too difficult to even try to compare. When you find a star that actually is in line with the galaxy, you are out 11 light years away at the Struve or Struve binary, a known flaring system, but which would have had its major outburst well before the X-ray telescopes launched. And obviously, data into the past for comparison isn't there either. While we do have lots of good data on what stars are where, we just do not have the same level or timeline of data for super flare level outbursts. You get further out and all of those other differences between the stars take the difficulty over the edge. And so you might ask the question of this three part mini series, what does it prove? What's the most we can say? Well folks, this indeed was a tangent mini series. This is not the proof of the disaster. 
The proof comes from primarily the wholly mainstream recognized cycle of magnetic excursions and disasters after the world's number one geophysics journal ended that discussion this year, which you can learn about at one of the video links listed below this video. And we know that much is set. We know we are due for another time-wise, and the magnetic field is indeed changing like it hasn't done in thousands of years. Furthermore, the isotopes like aluminum-26 and the transuranic elements suggest a nova-level energetic event, and that nova can also explain the impactors, but that doesn't work the other way around, not to mention that the impactor can't cause a magnetic reversal. The surge deposits found around the world are water-driven and are just one piece of evidence for the continental-sized waves. The polar tropical marine skeletons and their abundance of coal tell a different story of their historical latitude. The astrophysics says the sun has a sixth gear, the geophysical evidence says it's been used on Earth before, and the cosmology indeed suggests that the double whammy nova trigger arrives at the galactic scale. And that, folks, is the proof. The movie, the 23-episode series, and the follow-up videos before this three-part miniseries tangent. This miniseries is, in fact, the response to a challenge by a quasi-skeptic of the galactic trigger who does happen to be a friend of mine, a Yale professor who has long been asking for anonymity for his help, and he had said that this theory and past evidence for the galactic trigger and the Earth catastrophe cycle was all there, but that I had one serious problem. The other planets, the nearby stars in line to be hit before us, should be showing the change as well and be showing it to us with hard evidence. The planets, they were a little easier. But even I believed initially and told him so, there was no way to do this for the other stars. I was certainly wrong after accepting his challenge, and no, there is not a ton of data to digest, but the entirety of the reliable data that does exist shows the events we're looking for, unprecedented flaring from the stars in line ahead of us. Again, this is not proof, but it was a challenge to all the other evidence and the explanation for it. And it turns out, that the data that does exist supports, not cuts against, the primary galactic trigger hypothesis. The planets, the closest stars, say it's arrived at our system already and begun taking its toll. 2046, 2052. No chance I'm waiting until then to be ready, especially because as the magnetic shift continues, the problems could become world-rocking years before the solar micronova, the magnetic field is changing in an unprecedented way already. So I'll see you in the morning. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.